Hey, this is Brett the Hitman Hart, and you're listening to InYourHeadOnline.com. All right, we're back here at In Your Head, and now we're joined by Mario Mancini, who will be appearing for the New England Fan Fest and Hall of Fame June 21st in Warwick, Rhode Island. And the website, to get all your information, get your tickets, is NEPW, as in New England Pro Wrestling, HOF, as in Hall of Fame, dot com. Welcome to In Your Head. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. Now, you know, as uh, someone in New England, I grew up in Massachusetts. I saw you uh, for years on WWF television. Um, when did you start with WWF? Um, I started six weeks after I graduated high school, July 31st, uh, 1984. So right after high school. So was that like always your dream to uh, be a professional wrestler? Since I was 14 years old. So I... I uh, I graduated on June 20th, 1984. I turned 18 on June 21st. And uh, July 31st, I was in the Big C. Mid Hudson Civic Center working with uh, Greg Valentine. I went to wrestling school for 10 months during, uh, from October to July of my senior year of high school. Mm-hmm. Oh. Now, how did that you know, come about? Because I would think in 84... It would be harder to get in the business than today with all the, with I know there's wrestling schools then, but not like today. Uh, you know, right out of high school, how did you get involved in a wrestling school? Did you know somebody? Well, well yeah. What happened was when when before I just turned seventeen, um, you know, I'd go to the New Haven Coliseum every month to watch wrestling, and um, I'd always get floor seats, you know. And I, I, you know, I'm the last of six kids, my, you know. My two brothers and my my one sister and my mother and father would go, and um, you know a referee went to to get into the ring and my father stood up and he went, hey Tony, Tony, and he looked down and he saw my parents and said, hey Ralph and Gloria, I said you know that guy, he said yeah that's Tony Altamar, the Stanford Stomper, you know he was uh, tag team champions with Lano back in the '60s, we grew up with him. I said, oh. So I showed up to New Haven the next month, and I said, uh, I want to be a pro wrestler. I, I, I waited at the door until, the, you know, everybody was starting to come in, and I, I, he came, and I said, I want to be a wrestler. And he said, well, what's your name? And I told him what my name was, and he goes, I, I know your parents. And I said, yeah. And he said, no, you don't want to do this. You know, just, just go to college. And I said, no, I want to be a pro wrestler. So the next New Haven came, and I stayed out and waited for him again. And he said no again. And then I went to the Harvard Civic Center because uh, I'd got my license in a car, so I went to the Harvard Civic Center. And he said no again. And then <clears throat> from Milford, Connecticut, it took me about I don't know four hours to find Madison Square Garden <laughs> at 17 years old. <laughs> and um, I saw him in the garden, and um, he said, "You're nuts, kid." And I said, "I want to be a wrestler." And um, he said, okay, I'm opening up a wrestling school at Passerella's Quest in Orange. Um, come there. He goes, but first meet me in New Haven next month. I said, okay. So I met him in New Haven um, the following month. And that's where I, I walked in. And um, it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The ring was already up. And um, my dear friend of uh, 31 years, Seth Cohen, was... Um, in the ring, taking drop kicks off the top rope from Kurt Henning. Oh, wow. And, and Harry Fuji was there. And uh, Tony uh, Tony had an idea, I guess, before I got there. And he looked at Uncle Harry and he said, uh, you know, this kid wants to be a wrestler. And Uncle Harry said, oh, oh good, 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 good. So um, he made me do um, 250 Hindus. Um, which are standing air squats. And then he made me run all 24 sections of New Haven Coliseum from the floor to the ceiling. Um, I threw up in the middle of it, and uh, uh, he made me clean it up and continue. And then um, I got into the ring, and basically he just stretched me. And while he was stretching me, he just kept um, mushing my face into the canvas until he took a layer of skin off my face. Oh. My face was about a scab for three weeks, and, and uh, it came out. My face was all raw and bleeding and stuff, and 
uh, Tony Altamar just kind of chuckled and said, uh, uh, so uh, when do you want to start to wrestling school? I said, well, when you start, or can I come back here? <laughs> and um, his, his mouth just dropped, and he said, oh, oh uh, you can just show up to the wrestling school, I guess. And... Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I went to the wrestling school, and um, it was me, Seth Cohen, AJ Petrucci, which who is uh, one half of the Super Super Destroyers. Uh, he's already been inducted in a in a, in a Hall of Fame in Pennsylvania. Um, and Dave Barbie cannot find Dave Barbie. Wish I could. Um, us four. And there were people that came in after, um, you know, they'd come in on a Saturday and, and do a day in the ring. A day in the ring on a Saturday was about five hours. And, uh, you know, we'd come back Sunday morning and they wouldn't be there. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I just from there, I, I, I just kept going. And, you know, a lot of good people came walking through there. Paul Roma, Steve Blackman, Ted Arcidi couple good people came through there. Mm. Now, um, so you, right from wrestling school, you just went right to the WWF? I did. I, I, I What I did was I, I went there and um, my first match was against Greg Valentine. And um, I went there and <clears throat> I worked in the ring a little bit. And there were agents watching. And there were a lot of people there that day. And, you know, there were a lot of giant people there, and a lot of people had muscle on their lobes and everything. And Vince McMahon, at the ripe old age of 33 years old, made an announcement that he was looking for mechanical wrestlers. He was looking for grapplers. He was looking for Greco-Roman professional wrestlers. He was looking for scientific wrestlers. He didn't care how big you were. He didn't care how, how many muscles you had. He was looking for workers. And um, it was a little intimidating for me because I was a boy in a man's world. And, um, you know, uh, Howard Finkel came up to me and said, go downstairs and see Grove Monsoon. And I went downstairs to see Gino and he said, you know, sign this contract. And I said, do I need a lawyer? He said, no, if you want to sign this contract. <laughs> and I said, okay. And I signed it. And... Um, I worked with Valentine that night and I said, you know, can I get a comeback? And he said, absolutely. After you submit to the figure four, you can get off the canvas and come back to the dressing room. And I said, okay. <laughs> and I, you know, I went out there and then on August 9th was my next match and West Warwick, Rhode Island, which is very ironic, uh -huh. extremely ironic. Uh, August 9th, 1984, at the West Warwick Music Theater. Um, I worked with Dr. D. David Schultz, and um, that was my christening. He broke my nose in two places, mm. and um, that was a $3,300 bill. And, um, you know, it's just so ironic 30 years later that I'm being inducted into the Hall of Fame in the very town I got my nose broken in. So yeah. <laughs> it's kind of well, so it's the Mm -hmm. No, you know when they uh, when they you know approached you and said you know we want to put you in the New England you know Hall of Fame uh, you know what did that mean to you? Um, it, it meant it meant everything to me uh, because <clears throat> this comes from experience. Um, after getting out of uh, the WWE ninety two and tooling around for a while. Um, this comes from experience, from knowledge. Um, Joe Bruin in the New England Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. It's funny, I made him laugh because he reminded me about this show tonight. And I said, okay, Vince. <laughs> uh, he is the closest thing to Vince McMahon in this wrestling business I've ever seen. He, he his organizational skills are impeccable. Uh, the energy he puts into it is untiring and... He does it with with perfection. Um, it would be very scary to see him run a wrestling organization. Uh, he he really he really has his act together, 
And uh, if he had the capital behind him, I think he can run a successful company. In fact, I, you know, I think he should be working for Vince McMahon himself. Um, you know, he, he really, and, and he acts like Vince McMahon, which really makes me laugh. He's very talkative on a computer. If you talk to him on the phone, he's very talkative. But when the day of the event, he's kind of just looking past everybody and he gives you very one word short answers. And it really makes me feel like I'm around Vince again. Um, you know, so for years, um, for years I was asked to do these things and I, I said, no, I really don't want to do them. And, um, you know, um, Mike, the fog man of Vittable gave Joe Bruin my phone number and he called me and he said, listen, um, you're in demand. You know, I really need you to come to this convention, you know, this fan fest. And I'm like, nah, nah. You know, it was just a job where nobody wants to see me, you know. And he goes, no, you really, you're a novelty. People want to see you. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm really not interested. And he said, look, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be straight with you. Uh, you know, you made it in the second edition of the WWE Encyclopedia. And I went, I did. And he's like, yeah. And um, he said, I have somebody coming all the way from Japan, all the way from Japan to see you. And I, I have to have you there. This guy's coming all the way from Japan. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I felt responsible <laughs> to be there. So um, I went, and um, I forgot, totally forgot about my life. And I was lost in the 80s inside that room, and I had the time of my life. Yeah. And um, I have Joe Bruin to, to thank for that. And, you know, I knew prior to that fan fest last year, um, Joe's like, you know, I want to induct you in the Hall of Fame next year. And I was just, like, taken back by it, you know. And, um, you know, uh, I have a, 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 an enormous amount of gratitude to Joe Bruin and all his hard work and, and um, for bringing – the thrill back for me, you know, without, without the bumps, basically what that scene, and I know my mentality, basically what that fan fest is, mm -hmm. is a huge dressing room and the fans are allowed to come in. It's just a huge dressing room to me. I saw Barry and Billy demolition he screamed and hugged each other. And I saw DiBiase again. I, I freaked them out. And I, he didn't see me. I was behind him. And I, I said, Ted, I said, Ted, Ted, what, what time, what match are we out? And he turned around and went, Oh my God. You know, <laughs> it, you know, it, I saw Mike Jones. I saw Virgil. Tony Atlas is a constant in my life. He's like a brother to me. You know, I saw Bobby Heenan, what I saw of Bobby Heenan. Um, you know, it was just, you know, Danny Davis with that, that, Grin he's got on his face, and and you know I saw Snuka, and it, it was just amazing. It, it really was just amazing, and it, and and it, and it brought me back. And we're there telling war stories, and you know I'm I'm talking to Howard Finkel and going over the old days, and and you know mm -hmm. I was I was very fortunate. You're right. I I went right to the WWE. Well, let's face it, the WWF. You know, I went right right there, and, you know, guys like me, they came and went, you know, yeah. frequently. Um, but I was fortunate, thanks to Vince McMahon, I was fortunate to be there eight years, <laughs> eight steady years. And, you know, I got out, and and I said to myself, gee, I really, that didn't happen the way I really wanted it to happen. You know, it, yeah. I didn't, I didn't so intend... Bad, yeah, yeah. I, I I didn't I didn't intend for my career to go that way. Right, right. And you know, because I was I was an excellent wrestler. You know, when Tony Altamar would talk to other guys, I'm going to work with like Valentine was. He didn't ask until we were on top of the stairs at Poughkeepsie, and Albano was his manager at that time, and Gino wasn't on the mic then. He wasn't on the headset yet, mm -hmm. and Altamar was on the headset. So, you know, Valentine decided to look over at me and go, 
how long you've been working. And I said, uh, this is my first professional match. <laughs> and he went, oh, man. <laughs> and Albano, Albano started laughing and shaking his head, you know. And um, Valentine looked at Altamar and said, I got to get over, man. Is this guy, you know. And Altamar looked at him and said, the kid's got talent. He's the best I got out of my wrestling school. He's, he's absolutely got talent. And he's like, okay. And, you know, the match went fine. Um, I sold the hell out of it like I was supposed to. And, and you know, that was about it. So, but, you, you know, you're right. I was, I was very fortunate. And it was kind of strange to me when I got out in 92 and I, I did some independence. Not that I think independent wrestling is the, the grassroots of this business. And I give those guys all the credit in the world. But, it, it, you know, it just wasn't the same. And, and when I got there, I, I found myself wanting to teach. And I, and I did teach. You know, Al Tamar went to put the wrestling school in 89, and I took it over. I took it over from 89 to 92. So I felt compelled to teach because I, I was in the dressing room, and the Atlas happened to be there, and we're sitting there. <laughs> and and they're going okay. I'm, uh, the bell's going to ring, and then I'm going to get in your headlock, and then I'm going to throw you against the ropes, and then you duck the clothesline, and I'm going to turn around, and I'll give you a lead frog, come back, I'll give you a backdrop, and then and and I'm listening to something, and I'm like, there's there's no way these guys are going to remember all this, because in in New, what we used to call New York, when you said New York, that meant the WWF. Mm-hmm. In New York, you would say, what's the high spot, and you'd, you'd say what the high spot was. And then you'd say, what's the finish? And then you'd get the finish, and then you'd walk away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you'd go in there and work work a match. You know, you you you'd work a match. That's why you're called a professional wrestler. Mm-hmm. You know, so it, I was, it, it was really, um, even when I tag teamed in the independents, they'd get together, and I just kind of walked away, and I said, listen, I, I'll let you know. Like, what do you mean you're going to let... I go, listen, I'll let you know. Call the spots in there. Don't worry about it. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, but those independent wrestlers work hard. They work hard for very little money, yeah. and they have big dreams, and they're just they're just awesome people. Um, you know, th- these people do this on the weekends. They have full-time jobs during the week. They travel, and they do it because they love it, because they're not making a living from it. They're doing it because they love it, you know? So... Um, I give them a lot of credit. I really do. Yeah. You said, you know, the your career didn't turn out uh, the way you wanted it. And do you think a lot of that is because you were so young and you just, you know, went with the what they asked you to do? Do you kind of wish sometimes that maybe uh, you had gone to, like, uh, the territories and then worked your way up to the WWF? Well, you got me on the phone for stories, so this is stories you're going to get. Uh-huh. So, um I think, and I know, if I trained in a gym, in another gym where the ring wasn't present, because I'm going to steal a line from Tony Alice, Mm -hmm. Mario Mancini was Mario Mancini's worst enemy. Um, I, I needed to work out at Gold's or another gym because I'd start working out with the weights. And then guys that were just joined the wrestling school would come in, and maybe they worked out during the day, and they went into the ring at night. And I'm working out at night. And I could be doing front pull-downs for my back, and I hear boom, boom. And sometimes I hear boom, 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 boom. When you hear boom, boom, that's a bad bump. And... You know, I look behind my shoulder, and you know the guy would be hitting the turnbuckle like a four-year-old. Well, before you know it, I'd rack the weight, start walking toward the ring, going, "No, no, that no," and then I'd get in the ring, and all of a sudden, it'd be an hour and a half later. You know, and I didn't get to the weights like I wanted to. I, I really didn't get to the weights the way I wanted to until '89, until I met. Greg Hayes, and he taught me how to power lift, and then I joined the American Powerlifting Association, and I wanted steroids. And, and um, you know, I was able to, uh, you know, uh, 
body slam um, Buddy Rose at 317 pounds. Um, you know, and I, I start looking better. If, you know, you watch, if, if you go on YouTube and you pop up my match against King Kong Bundy and, and see them announce me and then switch right away to my match with The Undertaker, you, you'll, you'll say, yeah, he's right. You know, <laughs> so my match with Bundy was in 85 and my match with, with uh, Mark was in 90, you know. So um, I think if I did that and I think if I took Bret Hart's offer, uh, maybe things would have been different. But at that point, it was 1990. I already was there for six years and my attitude started changing. I started getting a lot more arguments with Strongbow who was like a second father to me. God rest his soul. He took his death very hard. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, wanting to get a break, I, I, I felt I paid my dues. And, um, you know, I was juicing it up. I was powerlifting. And, and I, wanted, I wanted my break. And Brett had just come in the dressing room. He sat next to me one night, and he was just staring at me. I mean, shoulder to shoulder with me, staring at me. I'm like, what? Because I guess the guys can sense that, you know, this is what I started doing. I started going, hey, Ted, do you really have to smack me that hard in the back of the neck and wake me up from that sleeper? <laughs> and he's like, I didn't realize I hit you that hard. I go, you left five finger marks in my neck last time. Do you really think you need to do that? Mm -hmm. I started going up to Savage going, can you make sure your tricep hits my, my chest instead of your rib cage hitting me in the sternum? Would you mind? I mean, I started getting cranky. Uh -huh. So <laughs> Brett, came, Brett came up to me, and he's staring at me. And I'm like, what do you want? And he just kept staring at me. I go, what? And he goes, how'd you like to go to Calgary? And I said, you want me to go to Calgary? He goes, yeah, you're getting killed. You got to get off the TV. I said, you want me to go to Calgary now? And listen, I was only 24 years old. I said, you want me to go to Calgary now after being here for six years? He goes, yeah, Mario, you got to get off the TV. I go, let me get this straight. You want me to go up with your father who's going to break my arm? No, 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 no. I go, six-year veteran. No, 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 it's going to be different for you. I said, it's going to be different for me. I'm still going to have to get on that bus with no heat, travel eight hours to make $40, and with cardboard wrapped around my legs because I'm freezing. I said, come on, Brett, you, you really, and I got to live in the house and I got to work the farm. Come on. He goes, look, it was just a suggestion. <laughs> you know what? When that guy looked at me and said that, I should have said, when do I leave? Mm -hmm. I should have said, when do I leave? Um, but I didn't, you know, yeah, I think things could have turned out a little differently. I, I, I think whether you're a, you're a professional wrestler, uh, uh, a rock and roll star or, you know, you're an executive for a company I mean, you look back at your career and there's always things that you can do, could have done differently, you know. There was, no, uh, what would, um, what, did he like see something in you and he just thought, you know, you could go up there and reinvent yourself and come back? Like, uh, oh, uh, yeah, he just wanted me off the TV because he was getting killed. But I, I always thought, and you know, Finkel had a great idea and, and Terry Garvin had a great idea just to, you know, flip out and go over one day, you know what I mean, on TV and just start from there. You know, even in my younger, in, it, in my younger day, even earlier in my career, 85, 86, you know, I had a reputation that, you know, even Hogan, when I would come back from a match, a house show, you know, they would shake their head and go, Man, do you work hard in that ring? And I was known, you know, as a really hard. I put a lot into it, you know. So, um, you know, I, I took pride in what I did. I, you know, I, I I took pride in in my execution um, of, of the moves and and the rhythm and the, the and that's the thing that might be missing today. You know, there there's a rhythm in there. There's a, there's there's timing, there's all kinds of, of psychology of professional wrestling that I was fortunate enough to be taught by the icons in this business. You know, so when I try to present my psychology, I mean, I, I've been taught by Pat Patterson, I've been taught by George Scott, I've been taught by Arnold Stolen, I've been taught by Chief K. Strongbow, 
I've been taught by Gorilla Monsoon. You know, I, I've been taught by Black Jack Mulligan, Jack Lanza, you know, I, Terry Funk, you know, Harley Race. You know, these, these, you know, there was one night, I remember, I was working with Leap and Lanny Tosso, and the finish was a flying body press off the top rope. And he put the, the move on me, and I, I got up while well, he was climbing the top. I got up from the canvas and started walking toward him. And I was walking toward him. He flew off the top rope and got me for the three, and the place went, yay. Mm -hmm. I go back to the dressing room, and Stolen looks at me and says, well, come here, kid. He said, when you get up tomorrow night from the canvas, get up walking backwards. Put your right foot out, go to spin around. Don't worry about him. He'll be there. And when you spin around, boom, he's going to hit you with that, that fine body press. So the next night I get up and I start stumbling backwards. And I take my right my right leg, I put it up and spin around. And he was right there on the chest and it placed pop. And that little thing was amazing. It was absolutely amazing it teaches you a lot it teaches you psychology pro wrestling you know so uh I, you know i don't know i i i wanted listen everybody wants to go over right everybody wants to be over mm -hmm. i just never i just never i never got over mm -hmm. you said that uh you know, we had chief j strongbow on um not too uh long before he passed away um you said you had uh the, you know you considered him like a second father to you and uh you but then you also said you uh you started getting arguments with him what were they about <laughs> well it was about the same thing and you know um you know chief would start in 1990 chief would start going once you get out you know i can count on one hand how many guys make money in this business mm -hmm. And I would always grab his finger and say, save this one for me, Chief. And, you know, he loved me like a son, and I loved him like a father. And I remember he called me in 88 or 89 when that big scandal came out and Pat had to take a powder. And um, he called me at home, and he said, uh, Vince asked me to be the booker. And I said, oh, my God, that's great, Chief. That's great. That's great. When you start, he goes, no, I turned it down. It's too much stress, man. And I go, what is wrong with you? And I started yelling at him. <laughs> and he yelled back at me. And he said, you want me to become the booker just so you could get over? I went, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> but, you know, usually it would be in the arena. And he'd see my frustration. He'd go, why don't you get out? I go, you know, Chief, you know, I paid my dues. I, asked, I did everything they wanted me to do. Why can't I get a break? It's been six years now. Why can't I get a break? I go, I, I don't get it. You can just get out. Just get out. I go, no, you're not doing anything for me. And he'd get kicked off at me. And he'd go, listen, when Pat came in, my power started dwindling. I don't have enough of, like, in 83 and 84, that guy can fire anybody. He fired Schultz when he smacked John Stossel. He said, you're fired. And nobody ever questioned the chief. That's when George Scott was the booker. George Scott. George Scott was a great man. George Scott was a tremendous booker, and he was a great human being. He loved me. My career would have been so much different if George Scott didn't get fired. When and, and you know what? If you talk to the other circuit people here that do these talk shows that I appear, appear live on or on the phone, I'm very candid and very honest. When Pat Patterson came in, I was, that was it. That was it. And he came in quick. I mean, I mean he came in like 85 or 86. Uh, you know, things didn't get, didn't get horrible for me, but they weren't the way they were when I was in, when George Scott was in. And, you know, what? Terry Garvin shielded me. And that's another great human being, Terry Garvin. Let me tell you something. When I heard what I heard about Terry Garvin, my jaw dropped. There's a kid, a guy that always talked about his wife, how much he loved his kids. And I, I'm, I realize, I, I'm not a naive person, I realize that. But let me tell you something. That guy was never anything but respectful to me. He liked me. 
You like the way I worked in the ring? When I um, the office leased me out for an independent show in Shelton once, he lived in Shelton. And he came and he, he stood out, he stood against the, the exit doors and watched the match because I was there. And he was a really, really good guy. And he's the one that shielded me from Pat Patterson. And, but for Terry Garvin, my phone would have never rang. My phone rang off the hook and the booking sheets came because of Terry Garvin. He was the one, you know. But, you know, I, I learned this valuable lesson when Strongbow brought his son in, Mark. I apologize if I forgot the name of his gimmick, but he's a redhead kid, and he wore um, the American flag, spandex pants, and he used to break dance in the ring. That was his gimmick. He would break dance in the ring. And he was there for a while, and then he was gone. And by 1992, that's what convinced me. That's what really did it for me when I had my final fight with Strongbow, and he said, with tears in his eyes, he said, I couldn't do anything for my kid. What am I going to do for you? And I went up to Vince McMahon in Huntsville, Alabama, and I said, I can't do this anymore. And he gave me the same answer. I like you. The office likes you. I go, I can't do it anymore. He goes, man, you're only 26 years old. I go, I can't be 30 years old the job, or I can't do it. I can't. I got to do something else with my life. He said, no hard feelings. And I walked away. No. Did he offer you anything else? Like no, yeah, you know. no. I didn't put anybody in the seats. Well, what's he gonna offer me? He didn't. He didn't we could offer me a gimmick. Now, there were rumors after I got out at production meetings for gimmicks. Mm -hmm. My name would always come up, and Strongbow would go, "Yes, yes, yes," and Garvin would be like, "Absolutely," and Vince would say, "Yeah, well, I can say." And Pat said, "No." Pat said, "No." Pat Patterson said, "No." What was so, it? What was it? Do you think with Patterson, he just didn't like you personally, or was it? Well, you really want to know? Yeah. Okay. Well, Lombardi was his guy. Mm hmm. In more ways than one. Yes, yes. As the Kamala song has told us, yes. So we were in the Nathan Coliseum, and I I decided that I was going to talk to Pat Patterson. Mm hmm. I said, Pat been around for a while now, you know. I did a stretcher for Ordendorf before WrestleMania 1. I did a stretcher for Bundy before WrestleMania. I did a stretcher for Savage before WrestleMania. I said, there's nothing I, I didn't do. I said, I make the crowd pop during house shows. I said, one house show, Valentine was put on his knee pads. He used the next match out. After my match with Mike Sharp, he looked at he looked at Skullin and said, "How the hell am I going to follow that?" I said, "Listen, please. I like you. The office likes you. Just be patient." He walked right away from me, and he was about ten feet away from me. I said, "My ass isn't cute enough for you." And he said, "What did you say to me?" I said, "I didn't say anything." He goes, "No, no. What did you say?" I said, "I didn't say anything." He goes, no, I didn't think he did. And, you know, Lombardi was his guy. And Lombardi had the same job I did. And when Lombardi got his break, I didn't keep my mouth shut. I didn't keep my mouth shut. And I said a lot of things. I said a lot of things. Because as far as I'm concerned, he couldn't wrestle his way out of a wet paper bag. So, I, you know, and I've worked with him. Mm hmm you know, so, uh, you know, it was it was tough there. I mean, Chief was there. You know, as long as Chief was there, nobody was going to say anything to me. And nobody was going to do anything to me. Because Strongbow was there. Strongbow was my protector. You know, there were nights at the TV table. There were not, I'd get dressed, and he'd say, go get paid. And I'm not ready to get paid yet, Chief. He'd go, go get paid. But Chief, I'm not ready to get paid yet. He said, just go get paid and go home. I said, what do you mean go get paid and go home? I'm working. He goes, not tonight. I said, Chief, what's your problem? You, 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 I got heat with you or something? Did I do something to, to get you mad at me? He's like, no. And I wasn't. And I wouldn't leave him alone. 
And he finally grabbed me by the back of the hair, which was a signature move. And he said, listen to me. They want you to work with the Legion Boom. And you're not. You're not working with them. I said, okay. He did it once, once before. After Roman got his ribs cracked, they wanted me to work with uh, Dewey Robertson. He wants me to work with uh, the missing link. Strongbow said, no, 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 he's not, not doing that. You know, he was he was there for me all the time. Um, so, was it because uh, the LOD is known as the you know, hurting guys with the uh, Doomsday device? Yeah, yeah. And Strongbow just wasn't going for that. Mm-hmm. What was it about? I, was Missing Link also a guy known to? Uh... No, Dewey was stiff, man. Yeah, he was stiff. <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, he's the guy who really started like the extreme wrestling. You know what I mean? He was, he did some crazy stuff in there with his head butts and the chairs and all his other stuff. He yeah, was kind of nuts. Yeah, he had his run in because you know I I was watching you know, every wrestling back then, but uh, his run in WWF was very short. Right. So was our CDs as much as I tried. I tried so hard with Ted. But you know what? He was such a massive human being. He was just too stiff. Nice guy. He was just too stiff. <laughs> really stiff. So um, uh, what, what I was going to say is, you know, even as back as 85, 86, um, a very dear friend of mine, the only, the only time I really cried when somebody got fired <laughs> was Don Morocco. And, oh. and, um, you know, I was walking toward the ring in Poughkeepsie, and he was walking back from his match. And the jobber was still in the ring selling it. So I'm walking to the ring, hoping that the jobber rolls out before I get out there. And I come back. I'm, I'm passing Morocco. He pushes me. He goes, push me back. I pushed him back. He pushed me harder. He goes, push me back harder. And I pushed him back harder. And then we're out there going back and forth, pushing each other. Monsoon opens up the door, and he goes, Nancy, get to the ring, Morocco, get in here. <laughs> so I, I'm done with the match, and I go back. I couldn't wait to get back to the dressing room. So I go back to the dressing room. I go, Donnie, what the hell was that? What was that? He said, kid, I like you a lot. He goes, you never know. Right place, right time. Vince McMahon on that microphone. Weirder things have happened. Mm. You never know. He goes, I just tried to make something happen. Just took a minute. Just took a moment to see if something can happen. And I said, oh, thanks. You know, (laughs) it was, uh, he was a really good friend of mine. And uh, I was sad when he was gone. But um, you know, you just you just never know what's gonna 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 bring a break in this in this business. I, I find that you know guys like Lombardi, you know, that was a little, it, it was a push, it was a little unnatural. You know what I mean? Um, and he just didn't flow well. You know, Brooklyn Brawler. Yeah, the transition yeah. from from what he what he was to what he was doing. There was, I you know what he they. You know, they brought him out like, like you, you've never seen Lombardi. You know, yeah. Wasn't he a magician for a little while? I remember that, like, on uh, when I was, like, I was pretty. I was born in '76, but I was pretty young. And I remember the first time I saw him uh, on WWF TV. He was like doing some kind of magician gimmick, like on TNT. Do you remember that at all? No, he was. He, he wasn't. That wasn't Lombardi. It was uh he, well I know there was another magician guy did a thing on TNT but he did I did the magi- I I did the magician gimmick with the magician okay but there was a he did like magic tricks on on TNT once yeah I, I don't I don't know I, I don't I, I can't recall that but um I'm I'm the one that did the uh, it was a masked guy and I played Rock'em Sock'em Robots with him <laughs> and um. I did TNT. That's another one I, I wanted back because I sat right next to Vince, you know. Yeah. And I think that I think that's when when the public really really knew the truth because even the wrestlers would would be like, wow, wow, and because every now and then they'd say, well, you know, man, see how old are you? I'm like eighteen. 
They're like, what? I'm like, 18. <laughs> so, um, you know, I got a chance to sit there and say, you know, I'm only 18 years old. And because he showed a clip of me working with Chris, with, with Bundy, and he goes, what goes through your mind? And I'm like, you know, I'm only 18 years old. And Roma was sitting next to me. And, um, you know, I, I would want that back because after TNT was over, Vince got up and he said, well, that's one of the first times my sets really stayed together. I, you know, I said to myself, if you wanted me to wreck the set, man, I would have been more than happy to do that. No problem. You know, I, you know, so, um, one of those things, you know? Yeah. I was, a uh, TNT, I was a big fan of. It was very, just, it's a little weird to watch, uh, now, but when you were at the time, at the time, it was, uh, it was great. Yeah. And that's a, that's another thing that was really horrible because, um, you know, I go, I go to Poughkeepsie, you know, got my bag, you know, just walking in the dressing room and Finkel comes up and he goes, uh, Mario, we need you in the land over Maryland, uh, next Tuesday for Tuesday night Titans. And like, all of a sudden I didn't know I was walking. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God, something's happening here, you know? Oh, my God, oh, my God. And I was like, I didn't know who to tell or say anything to, you know? I'm like, and all of a sudden, SD comes up to me, and he goes, are you going to Maryland next next Tuesday? I go, yeah, you going? And he's like, yeah. And then Pete Doherty came up to me and said, yeah, hey, Mario, you going up to, to Maryland? I go, yeah. Uh-huh. And then Rusty Brooks came up to me and he went, "Hey, you go." I went, "Well, wait a wait a minute." So I go up to Finkel and I go, "Fink, what do you need me in Maryland for?" He goes, "Tuesday Night Titans." I go, "For what?" He goes, "The show." I go, "What's the show?" He goes, "The Unsung Heroes of Wrestling, the Losers." And I'm like, <laughs> "Okay." <laughs> uh. We had the Duke of Drugs restaurant a few weeks ago. Actually, when Joseph Bruin was uh, asking, you know, who had won the show, and, uh, you know, he got us a lot of, uh, quote-unquote, you know, big-name people, and I told him, was like, I really would also like some of the guys that, you know, I grew up watching, and that would be uh, the Duke of Dorchester and yourself, Mario Mancini. So I'll let, me tell you so, well, let me tell you something. Pete, Pete's a great human being. You know, I, I, was, I was so happy to, to do a job for him. We were in the Boston Garden, mm-hmm. and um, he they were taping it because he he was going overseas on a tour, and they needed a tape to tape to go to go over there. And um, you know, he comes up to me and goes, "Hey, be a mind, brother." I go, "Pete, it'd be my pleasure. It'd be my pleasure." So you know, it was really it was good. Yeah. So I was happy to do that for him. Yeah. As I told him when I'm, because um, I used to get the Boston Garden shows here on Nesson, they're shit every month in the 80s, and uh, he had a short run as a color commentator, and I, I thought he he was excellent at it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The guy's got great one-liners, you know what I mean? He's really, he's a talented guy. He really is. He's got a lot of talent. He really does. Yeah, I have a, I, I've quoted on the show way before we had him on the uh, on the show, and it was always one of my favorite lines. He was the uh, he was the color, you know, the heel color guy. And they would replay, you know, the heel cheating, and he would say, "It's an optical illusion." And I, really? <laughs> <laughs> <that's awesome. laughs> oh yeah. No, um, you did bring up this word, and uh, I, I'm not sure, you know, what is the what is the the best stuff uh, phrase you said, jobber. Do you prefer jobber or enhancement talent or? Uh, I don't, you know, I get really offended when I hear enhancement talent. You know, okay. I really do. I do. Uh, I, I get. Uh, I get offended when I hear that. You know what I mean? Because, you know, <laughs> you, you're you're not in the car with me, mm-hmm. driving home at two o'clock in the morning, while I'm white knuckling my steering wheel because. I had to put somebody over that had less talent than I did. Mm-hmm. You know, um, that always bothered me. You know, I got to go in there and get a, you know, a high knee and, and get the back of my hair cut from somebody I 
I, I could I probably could have stretched out in 45 seconds. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? But because he grew up since he was a child with a tall guy with blonde hair in yellow trunks and boots, he got what he got. You know, so um, talent enhancement, you know, that by 1988, I knew what I was there to do. And I looked at Ray Hernandez and I said, Ray, if this is what I'm going to do, I'm going to be the best one here. Nobody's going to be able to do a job like me. You know, they had a, they had a, a saying in the dress room, nobody goes over the top like Mancini. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, it's going over the top rope. So, yeah, and- you know, I, I, I just, um, it, it, it is what it is, you know, later in life, you know, it bothered me for a long time. Um, but later in life, I kind of sat back and thought and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was there eight months before WrestleMania one. The Madison Square Garden prior to WrestleMania, I'm in there breaking up a fight with Hogan and Mr. T and Orton and Piper. I'm in the ring with a three-piece gray suit on breaking up a fight. Mm -hmm. I was the last match they saw against Orton uh, with Orndorff before WrestleMania 1 when I had a pile driver on the concrete floor. I was the last match they saw when Bundy gave me two avalanches and three splashes. That was the last match they saw when Savage gave me two elbows. I was the debut match of King Kong Bundy. Mm-hmm. I was the debut match of Demolition. SD and I were the debut match of the Heart Foundation. I was the debut match for Big Billy Busick. I was the debut match for The Undertaker. The, the new DVD they're coming out with The Undertaker's career, the first match on it is mine. So I look back and I go, I, I was there at a pretty monumental time. And um, I'm very thankful that I was in wrestling when I was. Um, it was a family. It was very close-knit. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a million guys. You know, when I got there in 84 is when it was the smallest, Mm -hmm. you know, it it was tiny. It was really tiny. It was me and SD and Mike Sharp and the moon dogs and often Sika and, Andre the Giant and Hulk Hogan and um, I don't even think Beefcake came there yet. And I don't even think he was there yet. And it was Snuka and Piper and Morocco and Valentine and Santana. You know, it it wasn't it wasn't big. And then one day, guys started coming in. I'm sitting in Poughkeepsie. I'm sitting there in Poughkeepsie. And I go up to Strongbow, and I go, hey, Chief. He's like, what? I go, I can't wear the, the Italian flag trunks I have. I, he goes, yeah. They don't want to let me. He's like, yeah. I go, I wanted to put my initials on my trunks. They won't let me. He's like, yeah. I go, who the hell is the guy that looks like he's got a bale of hay for, for, for hair, and he's got this M&M on his trunks? <laughs> who, the, who the heck is that? <laughs> and he goes, Randy Poffo. I go, who the hell's Randy Poffo? <laughs> he goes, just shut up and sit down, kid. <laughs> and that was his answer. Just shut up, shut up and sit down. Um, and, you know, who knew? You know what I mean? Who knew? And I got to know Randy. And, you know, you want to talk about another master of execution. Holy mackerel. Can that guy wrestle? Jeez. I mean, what a talent. He's a super talent, that guy. Um, may he rest in peace. But, um, you know, then Bundy came in. You know, Chris was sitting on the, on the bench in Poughkeepsie. And um, he was sitting on the bench in Poughkeepsie with 
sneakers, jeans, and a Fruit of Loom t-shirt, and he's biting his nails. <laughs> and I said, hey, I'm Mario Mancini. He goes, uh, I'm Chris. I said, you're King Kong Bundy, right? He goes, yeah. I go, okay. I go, you okay? He goes, well, I was, uh, I used to be in this territory before as a jobber. And I'm like, oh, okay. Because I have long hair and a beard, though, and a full body suit and everything. I'm like, uh, do you want to crush your black? I was 18. And I would go, do you want to crush your black? Well, what are you? It's like, no. I'm like, all right. Um, you're going to be okay. I said, uh, you know, I'm going to sell the daylights out of it. You, you'd be fine. In the back of my mind, I'm going, this guy is huge. I have to calm him down or he's going to kill me. <laughs> That's what I'm really saying to myself. i got to calm this guy down or he's going to kill me. Uh -huh. um, you know, but again, every, you know, I sold the daylights out of everything and everything went fine. And we ended up working three or four times together. And, um, you know, we, we built a relationship in the dressing room and, um, and on the road. And I think by WrestleMania three, he looked over at me and said, Hey, I'm an M. I'm like, yeah, what's up, brother? He goes, it's over. I go, Chris, tone it out. He goes, listen to me. It's over. I go, Chris, you stop. You're talking stupid. It's not over. He goes, what was the main event last year at WrestleMania? I go, you and Hogan in a cage. He goes, who am I working with this year? I go, Hellboy Jim and a, um, um, and a midget, a you and, 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 a, and another midget. And he said, yeah. I said, yeah, I guess. He goes, it's over. He goes, it's okay, though, because you know what? I saved every nickel. I have a house with a $30,000 mortgage. He goes, I saved every nickel I made, Mario. I go, Chris, God bless you. Good for you. Good for you. Good for you. And I got a call in my office in 1999 from a promoter in New York. And he said, um, I'd like you to work. Uh, on this date for me. And I'm like, where'd you get my number? You know? And he's like, I go, look, and I haven't wrestled for seven years. My timing's off. I said, I'd have to get in the ring for a couple of weeks, get everything back. I'm not interested. He goes, oh, I got the Westchester County Center. I go, how the hell did you get the Westchester County Center? How did you do that? He goes, I don't, I, I just got it. I go, I'm not interested. He goes, um, yeah, you're working with Bundy. And I said, what's the date and what time do I need to be there? <laughs> <laughs> so I went there and I saw Bundy and I saw uh, Pops, I saw Alpha, and I saw Bruno Sammartino. And, um, and Chris looked at me and said, you're going over tonight. I said, no, I'm not. He goes, yes, you are. I'm putting you over. I go, no, you're not, Chris. He goes, listen, you're everything you did for me. He goes, I'm putting you over tonight. That's it. I said, it's wrong. It's not happening. It's wrong. Mario Mancini does not go over on King Kong Monty. Not doing that. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, so, um. So I put him over. <laughs> <laughs> so I put him over. So, you know, of course, he came back in the dressing room. He goes, the hell's wrong with you? Stiff. You're huh? stiff. I thought I haven't worked for seven years. He goes, God, you were stiff. I'm like, I'm sorry. He goes, I owe you one. I go, bull, you owe me one. You know how many times you ribbed me and gave me a, an open hand chop to the chest? I said, my mother would look at me three weeks later and say, it's still not gone. You don't, I, you don't owe me nothing, Chris. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, 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 we had Bunny on the show. Actually, he doesn't like to do podcasts, but we met him at, at a show when he really liked us. He came on. I was very proud of that. And he's one of the, uh, probably, I think, maybe the only guest ever who uh, sent me a Christmas card. So uh, he's, he's yeah. got a kick on Bunny. But, oh, yeah, he's a great he's a great guy. Mm-hmm. Want to uh, thank you for coming on here, and uh, we could talk more to you. But actually, we've got a, we've got a Jose Luis Rivera coming on, who both of you will be at the New England Fan Fest and Hall of Fame, and both being inducted into the Hall of Fame 
June 21st, Warwick, Rhode Island, at APW yeah. as a New England Pro Wrestling. Listen, you tell Jose, Uh you tell Jose you just got off the phone with Mario Mancini, you hear how hard he laughs. (laughs) (laughs) I love him. (laughs) Another talented guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, incredible. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate you coming on. It's been a lot of fun. Anytime, I do these wrestling interviews all the time, anytime, I had a blast, and I hope to see you guys there. On my 48th birthday, June 21st, uh, at at, uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, and uh, then the Hall of Fame that night. I hope to see you there in Rhode Island at the New England Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame with my buddy, Joe Vince McMahon Bruin. Yeah, excellent. And it's like the (laughs) the third anniversary of having your nose broken by uh, Dr. D. David Schultz. uh, Ironic, isn't it? (laughs) Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. Okay. Hi, this is Tony, Mr. USA Atlas, and I'm in your head on land.com.